All right, um, let's continue. So um, if you look at the list of participants, I show up there twice. The second entry, uh, I have the word uh, questions next to my name. That's, that's where you want to send me messages during lecture if you want me to see them. Um, because I don't see the ones that, that are coming to my main login because I've got my screen maximized and so on. Um, so anyway, um, there was there was a question on my other one asking um, with the multiply instruction, how did I know the product would be in product L? So product H, product L together form a 16-bit result, and it's it's broken up like this: product H, product L. Since the number we were multiplying was 23, um, I knew that the product would fit in 8 bits, and so it would be here. But if our number was bigger than, than 8 bits, then product H would also have a value in it. And what you do with that you know, depends on, on your application and what you're trying to accomplish. But in general, you know, PIC is an 8-bit system, and so if we're going to get a 16-bit result, we've got to have some idea what we want to do with those upper bits um, and so it depends on your application but I was cheating because I just had a, a small number so I could just look at the product L piece and get my my 8-bit answer out of that so um, yeah you're welcome so um, this move LW minus one is is an interesting thing, right? The um, the assembler is smart enough to know that minus one should be represented as you know eight ones ff hex um, because we're using two's complement. And if I get a minus two and I assemble that, it loads an fe. So if you find yourself back in time someday and you're doing your 250 homework and you want to do two's complement problems, all right, what's minus 17 and two's complement? Bingo, it's eight nine hex. All right, so MP Lab is doing that for us. So we have a radix instruction. where I can say radix hex and so when I say move LW and I just say 17 it puts 17 hex into the W register and I'm just using move LW just because it's an easy instruction I could use any instruction I want what I'm looking at is how are these numbers interpreted by MP lab and if I say radix decimal and I say move LW 17, how does it code that? It codes it as 11 hex. Well, 11 hex, 16 plus 1, that's 17 decimal. So this radix instruction is saying if I just have a bunch of digits sitting next to each other, what is that thing? Is it hex or is it decimal? And if I don't say radix anything, and I just go ahead and assemble this code, it looks like by default the radix is hex. And it's probably documented somewhere, but I would never assume that. I would either use a radix instruction or always specify the radix express, uh, specifically, for example, move LW 0x17. Absolutely clear, whatever the default is, whatever my radix instruction might be, this is going to move 17 hex. And there's other things we can explicitly specify. So for example, if I wanted to explicitly say 17 decimal, I can put a period in front of the 17. That looks weird because it looks like 0.17, but it's actually a shorthand for 17 decimal. So that gets coded as 0x11. <coughs> I can also do this D apostrophe 17, and that means 17 decimal, and so it again gets coded up as 0x11.
But we can also use this to do binary. So if I say B single quote 1011 and I assemble that, it codes it up as hex D 13 because 1101 in binary is decimal 13. So if you have a long decimal number that you want to load in and and you don't want to do the conversion in your head or you think it's clearer to leave it in binary in your code, you can express binary by saying B quote and then put in the bit pattern. And even if I say radix hex in the beginning, if I say B quote or D quote or period or zero X, that's always going to take precedence over what the default radix is. The radix statement only affects if I don't specify um, what kind of argument I want. So if I have an operand with just a bunch of digits sitting next to each other, um, it'll use whatever the default radix is. I don't know if that answered the question I just got, but if not, go ahead and ask that question again. All right, so those those are things that we can do to um, to clean up our code sometimes and and minimize mistakes. Um, here's another biggie. Uh, let's see, so I got a question here. So so saying B quote 1101, that's going to be binary because I've got the B there. Right, and when I assemble this, I can confirm that by seeing that the move LW instruction coded the operand as hex D. So B quote will always be binary, D quote will always be decimal, 0x will always be hex, regardless of this radix instruction. So here's, here's the real difference. something. There we go. <clears throat> Alright, so 0 x 10 is hex. D quote 10 came out as 10 decimal, right, A hex. Point 0 .10 came out as 10 decimal, A hex. And B quote 10 came out as 2 decimal, right, which is binary 10. And I had a radix hex instruction up here, but that didn't make any difference. And if I just say move LW10, that came out in hex because my radix was hex. If I change my radix to dec and I rebuild, none of these first four instructions change. But this instruction where I didn't specify what type of number 10 was, that got changed into decimal. I don't know if you can do bin as a default radix. Yeah, you can. Uh, nope, you can't. So our default radix can be decimal, octal, or hex. So you know it said build successful, but um, but it's worth going back and looking for warnings, and warnings can be meaningful. Um, so on line 8 where I specified the radix, it's telling me it expected decimal, octal, or hex. And since it didn't see one of those, it's using hex. Well, that's really important to know um, because I might think it's going to use binary as a default radix, but in fact it's, it's using hex. So right, radix only works when you don't specify the type of thing that the num is. 
Also says I'm missing a quote on here. I'm wondering if it wants a quote at the end. Yeah, okay. So I guess the proper way to use these things is to put your number in quotes. Again, getting rid of your warnings. So decimal D quote number and then an end quote, same for binary. All right, uh, different topic. So um, let's take this this number ten hex and let's copy that to the tri-state A register. So remember what tri-state A does. I'm taking the number 10 hex, which looks like this, and I'm copying that to tri state A. This is controlling whether certain bits on port A are inputs or outputs. And remember, 0 means an output, 1 means an input. So by copying this to tris A, I'm saying I want all of my port A bits to be outputs except this bit right here which is RA01234 I want that bit to be an input. So typical kind of thing you might do in your initialization along with um, move LW0X7F move WF add con1 And I expected that to blow up horribly, and it didn't. Okay, we're fine. Um, oh. There we go. Okay, that's what I was expecting to happen. All right, so here's here's my code, right? I'm putting a value into Trisse, I'm putting a value into addcon1. If you just write your code like this, right, an origin statement and your instructions and an end statement, you get errors. Okay, the error I'm getting here is saying that um, Trisse is not previously defined, addcon1 is not previously defined. Okay, and in the labs, you'll see something like... Um, something like this, right, where we define um, port A to be F80, or maybe port A equals F80, right? And, and the code for lab one was filled with a whole bunch of these statements in the beginning. Um, avoid making those kinds of statements, okay? So the line that I deleted, this is the line that you actually want to use, um, include p18f1220.inc. If you put that somewhere near the beginning of your program, it will set up these symbols for port A and tris A and addcon1 and so on and so forth. And then it'll know what to do with those. Okay? This is just like C. There's a file called p18f1220.inc that defines all of your symbols that you would need for this processor. It defines Tris A and AdCon1 and so on and so forth. So here's the file that you're including when, when you say include p18f1220. Um, it's you know got copyright information and, and stuff like that. But it's it's got a whole bunch of defined statements. So um, it 
um, set port A equal to F80, port B equal to F81, it sets up ADCON1 to be equal to uh, hex FC1. This is another way to specify a hex number, H double, H single quote, and then the number. Right. So by, by using this include file, it sets up all these symbols for you. And it saves you from having to say number sign define, number sign define. Um, and making a typo in those defines is really, really painful to find. So include this file, right? Just put this number sign include statement in the beginning of your program. And you don't need to define your ports and your tri-state registers and so on and so forth. All right. Um, let me talk a little bit about bit masks. A little bit more about bit masks, which we talked about last week in terms of um, breaking our input number in Lab Two into two pieces: a high piece and a low piece. And let me try to give you a, a different view of what's going on with these. I'm doing some paper craft here. Hold on a second. So let's suppose we're we're reading a value from an input port, right? So so we've got switches hooked up to our chip, and the idea is we've got four switches. You know, wired properly to VCC, and these are going to RA zero through RA three. And let's say this is set to a 1001. So these are shorted, those are high. And we would like to read these four values from you know, the outside world and know that the value that's being set on these switches is 1001. And the problem is if we say something like move F port A comma zero, Our W reg is going to look something like this. It's going to have our 1001 coming from our four switches, but we don't know what these upper four bits are. Maybe there's other switches that are doing something else. Maybe those things are set up as, as outputs. Maybe those pins are just disconnected and they're floating and somebody walks by with a hair dryer and this bit might change to, you know, a one because there's some environmental noise, some electromagnetic interference that drove that to a one. Or maybe, you know, all of these will be zeros, or maybe they'll all be ones. The goal of my code is to pull off these four least significant bits and do something with them. But if my W reg looks like this, how do I know if I've got a 1001 in here? Can I say, is my W register equal to 9? Well, no, it's not, it's not, it's not. In this case, it happens to be equal to 9, right? Because these upper bits are all 0. But we've got this stuff over here in these upper positions. And we want to get rid of that. So we use a bit mask. So I'm going to say move literal into the W register. And I'm going to move the following bit pattern. Four zeros followed by four ones. And I'm going to think of it like this. Right? Now, if I end this literal value, I shouldn't have put that into W. But if I end this literal value, Let's call this port A. If I end this bit mask with port A, what it does is it changes 
these four most significant bits into zeros. Right? It makes my port look as if it contains four zeros followed by one zero zero one. If port A happened to look like this, when I do the AND operation of the W register with port A, the result looks like this, four zeros followed by one zero zero one. Four zeros, one zero zero one. Four zeros, one zero zero one. So a bit mask lets me throw away certain bits. Well, I can't really throw them away. We can't delete things. But I can put them into a known state, usually zeros. So this is a bit mask. And it's really like, you know, masking something before you spray paint it. It covers up certain bits to protect them, right? These four bits are not going to change value. But these other bits are going to get forced to a zero. Why? Because when I AND anything with a zero, I get a zero. Whereas when I AND something with a one, it doesn't change value. So suppose I want to know if port A, if these four bits were equal to zero. Well, if I just look at port A and I say is equal to zero, no, it's not. But if I mask it, if I AND it with this bit pattern, right, and those four least significant bits were zero, my entire result is zero. Whereas if those four least significant bits were non-zero, now when I AND it with my bit mask, my result is non-zero. So a bit mask lets us focus our attention on, on a particular piece of, of our, our number. And so for lab two, what I suggested doing was, was using a bit mask like this to throw away the upper four bits and just keep the lower four bits. Move that into a file register and now you have a copy of your input where the upper four bits are zero and the lower four bits are your number. And then if you do a swap F, right, to move these four bits here and those four bits there, and then mask again, that gives you your, your second number that you're trying to add. All right, so that's, that's the bit mask business. Let's talk about detecting if your input has changed. And this comes towards the end of lab two, right? You can get all of lab two working and then deal with this question of how do I know if my input has changed? And the goal is you want to read port A and you don't want to do anything else unless port A has changed. So let's suppose that port A looks like this. In other words, the person using this, this system is asking to add the numbers 2 and 3. Alright, so the first time you get this, you take this, you break it into a 3, you swap, you mask, you get a 2, you add them together as 5, you push that out to port B. Now you come back to the top of your loop, and you look at port A, and it's still equal to this. You'd like to have a way to detect that that's the so what the current value is, that's the same as what the value was the last time through. So let's, let's write some pseudocode. So you're going to initialize things. AdCon1, TrisA, TrisB, all of that stuff. Okay. And then you're going to... Um, You're going to copy port A, bits 3 through 0, into, I'll just call it num1. You can call it whatever you want. But I'm going to, to grab those four low bits of port A, and I'm going to save them somewhere. And then I'm going to read the upper four bits. and put that into another number, num2. And then I'm going to add those together. 
and then I'm going to copy that sum to port B and then I'm going to go back up here to the top so that's most of lab 2 okay um, but let's add in this business of only doing all of this stuff if our input has changed so here's a way to do this let's see if port A is equal to the last value that we read from port A and if it is let's just go back and check it again and if port A is different from the last value that we read from port A let's just make a note of what the value of port A is now and then let's go ahead and do our usual steps right take port A's low bits, call that num1, call the high bits num2, add them together, copy that out to port B and then when we branch we just come back up here so we really just need one extra set of steps in the very beginning which is check to see if your port has changed value and if it hasn't check again and keep checking until you find that the port has changed value and then at that case go ahead and copy the current value of port into the location where you're saving the ports value and then proceed as usual so this is just something like move ff port a comma last port a where last port a is just some file register you've set up so how do we know if port a has changed um, we want to know if port a and the contents of this file register are the same well, a really easy way to tell if two things are the same is to say, is their difference equal to zero? So we could port, put port A into the W register. We could subtract last port A and, and check to see if the result of that subtraction is zero. Okay, so this, this brings us to the last big missing piece of assembly language, which is conditionals. Okay, being able to, to check conditions and act accordingly. So let's write some code. with W register. Let's use a file register. Um, so let's put an interesting value in here to begin with. see what this does all right so um so move a five into the w register we'll do that and then we'll move the w register into num so num which is this file register at location 80 is equal to five so we've got a loop here. We're going to move 1 into W and then subtract that from num. So the first time we do this, we move a 1 into W, we subtract that from num, num is equal to 4. This go to statement says, hey, don't go to the next instruction in memory. Go back to a previous instruction at a location called loop. 
So in our code, we had a line that said loop colon. And when we say go to loop, the assembler is going to look at that and say, okay, what instruction gets executed right after this label? Well, that's move LW. So it's going to code up this instruction to say, go back and start executing instructions from this spot, this move LW. So if I execute this go to, what happens? We jump back to this move LW. Puts a W into one, subtracts that from num, now num is equal to three, and we go back to loop. Okay, so this is this is how we iterate. And when I subtract one from zero, what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get 255 or hex FF. That's negative one in two's complement. And this will just keep counting down 252, 251, 250, and so on. All right, so go to is what we call an unconditional branch. And it's it's a 32-bit instruction and it basically codes up as go to followed by the address that you want to jump to. So it says go to 0x4, 0x4 up here is um, our move LW1 instruction. There's also a branch instruction, BRA for branch, that does exactly the same thing, um, but branches only take 16 bits to code. They don't let you branch as far as go to's. Go to's you can go to anywhere in the program memory. Branches you can only go to locations that are close to where you are right now. But they work exactly the same. So when you get to branch loop, it just jumps back to that instruction labeled loop. And now every time we go through, our location 80 is decrementing and so on. So those are unconditional branches. Now suppose we want to do this loop, but only until our number is decremented down to zero. In other words, suppose we wanted to do something five times. If we were in C, what would we do? Well, we could say, you know, count equals five. Well, count is not equal to zero. Do some stuff. Decrement the count. And so this loop will iterate five times. After the fifth time, count will decrement from one to zero, and our while loop will, will kick out, and we'll jump down after that closing curly bracket. Okay, totally typical thing to do in programming. So in assembly language, we code this with what's called a conditional branch. This is unconditional. This is conditional. The NZ means not zero. So this is coming back to the status bits and the status register. What I'm saying is, check the results of the last thing I did that updated the zero bit. And if that zero bit is not set, branch back to loop. All right, check the last thing that updated the zero bit. And if the zero bit is not set, go ahead and do your branch. Let me just put another instruction over here so we don't fall off the edge of the earth. And let's go ahead and start executing this. And so num1 is equal to 5, and you can see we're going to sit here in this loop. Num is equal to 4. There we set it equal to 3, and we loop. Now we decrement it to 2, and we loop. And we decrement it to 1, and we loop. And now we're going to subtract one from num, and num is going to change to zero. And now when we say branch if not zero, it's going to skip the branch because the result of that last subtract instruction was zero. 
So if I step one more instruction, it's going to come down to something outside of our loop. Okay, that's all you need to code up if then statements, for loops, while loops, do untils, do whiles, all of these things. It's all just conditional branches. And we've got a handful of conditional branches available. So we can say branch if not zero, that's BNZ. Branch if zero is BZ. Branch if negative, branch if not negative. Those are the most common ones we're going to use other than the unconditional branch. And so, so this is not looking at the last instruction necessarily. It's looking at the zero bit in the status register. And what controls that zero bit? Well, it depends what instructions were executed. For example, if I did a decrement file, that will update the zero bit. So if the last instruction I did before the branch was decrement file, and I say branch if not zero, it'll branch if the decrement did not result in a value of zero. But if my last instruction was a move FF, move FF does not touch any of the status bits. So the result of the move FF would have no bearing on the branch if not zero. It would be the instruction before that last updated the Z bit. So if I had a move FF and the instruction before that was a move FF and I had 20 move FF instructions, none of those affect the BNZ. But if the instruction before that was inclusive or W with file register, uh, that does update the zero bit. So my BZ would be branching based on the result of that inclusive or instruction. And in the simulator, right, you can see the values of these bits up here. And so if I do my move FF, that's not going to touch any of these bits. All right, so, so unconditional branch and then a series of conditional branch. And it's basically carry no carry, negative no carry, uh, negative not negative, um, overflow, no overflow, zero, no zero. And if you look at all anywhere online or you look at, at other solutions to pick problems, you're going to start seeing these skip instructions. Um, compare file and skip if equal, compare file and skip if not equal, all of these things. Don't use those, okay? I'm only going to say this once today. Don't use those. I just said it twice. Um, they're perfectly fine instructions. They are confusing as heck. And across the board, every time I've taught this course, the numbers are the same probably about 10% of the students can successfully use these instructions. Right? They're filled with double negatives, triple negatives, contradictory counterintuitive things. Um, learn how to use conditional branches. Branch of zero, branch of not zero, branch of negative, branch of not negative. You can do anything you need to do with just those instructions and you avoid a lot of needless complication. Okay. There's some code in the labs that use these conditional things, decrement, file, and skip if not zero, and so on and so forth. But when you're writing code yourself, stick to these conditional branches. Okay, branch of zero, branch of not zero, being the main two that you'll mostly use. And it will, it will save you a lot of time and a lot of confusion. And statistically, if you just always said, you know, compare file and skip if equal, or compare file and skip if not equal, you should be 50% of the time right, right? Doesn't happen. Most likely people get these things backwards. So I'm not going to talk about those for a while as far as what they do. Um, and I'm going to say steer clear of them. Okay, stick to control operations, conditional branches. That should be enough to do everything you need to do for lab two, okay? And remember, you can do all of, of this, right? At the end of your code, you have to do your branch back to the beginning, so that's just a branch or a go-to statement. 
And then once that's working, do this conditional business, right? Because one of the requirements in the lab is don't change the output, don't do the addition, don't do any of this work unless the input is changed. So the first thing you want to do in your loop is see has the input changed. And the way you do that is you've always got a copy of the previous value of port A. See if that's the same as the current value. So do a subtract, and if they're equal, their difference will be zero. So you can just say branch of zero back up to here. And you should be able to see this in the simulation that you run. You'll single step your code, and you'll just sit up here in this little loop in the top until you fire your stimuli to change one or more of the bits on port A. And then it should come down, it should do all of this stuff. It should break your number up, get two four bit numbers, add them, send it to port B, come back up here, and then it should start looping up here. And it should stay there until you fire another stimuli to change at least one of your bits in port A. And then you'll break out of that loop, go ahead, do your addition, set the sum to port B, come back up here and start looping up here again. When you're seeing that, your code is working correctly. Okay, or at least that part of your code is working correctly. So you'll want to test that in the, um, the simulator. You need more homework because we already did homework today. Um, so I'm going to give you questions 18 through 22, and and these will help you with um, these will help you with lab two. And I'll post this on on um, on Canvas after lecture. Um, so questions 23 through 26 will definitely help you with lab two, okay? This is talking you through basically making a two-bit adder that reads from, uh, from some pins and breaks your result up and sends the output somewhere. Um, but this, this talks you through it in steps, okay? So think about these questions, work through these questions. If you don't feel like they're helping you with lab two, don't worry about it, just do lab two. Um, but if you're stuck on it, if you're having trouble with this idea of moving things from one spot to another and so on, or understanding the tri-state registers, come back and look at these. Uh, in the homework, what does it mean by magic numbers? Uh, magic numbers are like 0x f84. So this this is just the include file business. Um, so let's see, I just saw that a moment ago. Um, there we go. So so write this code actually putting in the the hex numbers for port A um, and so on and so forth. And then, you know, assume that you've done the include statement and you can just call it port A or port B or whatever. Um, it's basically what we already just went through with, with looking at the include file. But just, just to make sure that you see that connection between, you know, writing out PORTA versus writing out 0x F80. Um, it's the same thing to the assembler. It's just two different ways that we can represent it. So write it using the actual hex addresses of those registers, and then write it using the names like port A. And I'll post some, some clarification on Canvas along with this homework. For example, for question 27, I want you to run your code in the debugger. I'll tell you what I want you to, to report from that, um, and so on. Um, so basic looping, keep incrementing a file register. That's an unconditional branch. Keep incrementing these two file registers and decrementing these two, that's just another unconditional branch, right? The shortest infinite loop, think about that. Um, and we'll talk more about 32 and 33 later.
Mm, let's see. Yeah, so I'll probably go up through through question thirty one. But I'll I'll post details on Canvas and I'll give you some extra instructions on what I want you to do for some of these questions. So I'll post those after class today. All right. That was a long two hours. Let me give you something fun on the way out. Um, this is an additional debugging tool that you can use. So let me go back to lab one. So this was this was my my version of lab one that you've already done. And by the way, nice job on lab one, everybody. Lab one looked really good, good clean reports, um, had all the pieces in there, and saw a lot of really cool new experiments. Okay, so so I graded those. I gave you some feedback. Um, um, but keep up the good work. Lab one looked fantastic. Um, and I love the new experiments people came up with. All right, so here's the code from lab one, right? And we already know that we can build this and we can run this in the debugger and we can look at you know file locations and we can single step and we can see what's going on and our code you know hangs out in this loop forever and then do I still have a stimulus I don't but I can set up a stimulus on RA0 and fire that and then step a few more times and my code would suddenly jump down to this increment L loop do some stuff and so on okay um, so that's the main way to debug your code because it lets you execute one instruction at a time it lets you look at file locations and so on and so forth but once your code seems like it's working I'm gonna give you another tool that you can use to look at it now if we weren't in COVID-19 right now we would be in the collaboratorium and you would take this code and you would run a different piece of the software and you would actually use um, something called a PIC programmer to take this code and load it into a physical chip and then you would take that chip and you would build a circuit around it that would have four LEDs connected to the port B pins and a switch connected to port A bit zero and by flipping that switch you would see the LEDs start to count okay and the way we used to do this we took a 555 timer and we built that up with a two second tick and we use that to um, drive pin zero, um, RA zero, and we would see the counter incrementing every two seconds as the 555 ticks. All right, so I cobbled something together um, over a break that we can use to, to sort of replicate that experience, and I'll tell you where you can get this, but um, it's just plain old Java file, okay, so it's a jar file. This should run under, um, at least Linux and Windows and theoretically under OS X. So um, this is a PIC 18F1220 front end. So load file. Um, go into wherever your directory is that you're creating your projects. Okay. And this is documented. I'll show you the documentation in a minute. Um, go into your project. Come down under distribution. Default. Production and you should see a .hex file okay open that up and this will start emulating the code that's in that hex file so that hex fi file is create created by MP lab when you do your assembly okay when you assemble your project you get this this disassembled listing all of these ones and zeros they get stored in a hex file okay it's it's a peculiar file format that has the ones and zeros that we would normally use to program the physical chip. So you can take this emulator, you can say load in that file and it will start emulating the code. In this case I have inputs on RA0 and RA5. I can check this box to put a 1 on that input. I can clear the checkbox to put a 0 and every time I toggle that my LEDs will start incrementing. So this is executing that code from lab one, but it's a different way to see what the code is doing. Right, and it's just incrementing my LEDs. 
And if I change my code, for example, instead of adding 1, I add negative 1. I can compile that, or assemble that. And I can come back to my tool, and I can say, let's load that file in again. And now, when I check my, my box, when I toggle pin 0 on port A, my counter is decrementing. And I can come in here and I can say, well, let's go ahead and let's add 5, which was a new experiment some people came up with. So let's assemble that and let's load that file in. And now every time that I toggle my input, I count by 5. So there's 10, there's 15, there's 20, there's 25, and so on. So that's a tool that's just kind of available if you want to play with it. Okay, pins that you set up with the tri-state registers to be inputs, those LEDs get X'd out. For example, RA0, I set that to be an input by setting the tri-state bit to be a 1, so that LED is X'd out. RA5 is an input by default, um, but then the other LEDs are outputs, so I can see those, but the input boxes are grayed out, so I can't set those as inputs. And you can mess with it a little bit. You can slow it down to you know one second per instruction and kind of see where it's going. But it's really just meant to be a, a sort of online replacement for actually programming a chip and hooking up LEDs and switches. Um, and we'll use this in, in Lab 5 in detail. Um, but it's there as another tool if, if you want to use it. Um, and if you want access to this, Go ahead over to engrcs.com, go to the course syllabi for 270, password is Clark. Take a look at lab six, sorry, lab, yeah, take a look at lab six online. And this will tell you where to get this, this uh, simulator from. So it's from GitLab, and you can pull it down, it's called pixim.jar. If you download it on Linux, you need to go into a terminal window, change it to be executable. If you download it on Windows, you should be able to just click it and it'll go ahead and run. And the first time you run it, it'll ask you where your MP Lab system is installed and it'll give you some hints how to find that. And um, it remembers the last location that you, you loaded a file from. So when I run this, I don't have to keep um, going back and browsing to my path. I can run it, and if I try to load a file, it'll start from the same directory that I did last time. So play around with that. Let me know how it works. We'll need to use it for lab six, which is the last lab of the course. Um, but mess around with it some if you like, and, um, and give me feedback on it. If you've done Java and you're interested, you can pull down the source code from GitLab. Um, it's just um, a couple of of Java files, right? And it uses Swing and Window Builder, and um, it's got a couple of threads, and it's a derivative of the code I did to make the Godzilla chicken that runs around in Minecraft. If anybody saw that video, it's exactly the same thing that I was doing in there, but instead of of driving Minecraft, I'm driving a simulator for the PIC processor. So that's um, that's something that's available for you. Don't use it as a replacement for MPLAB itself, right? Debug with the debugger in there, but once you've got something and you think it's working, like your 4-bit adder, you can go ahead and pop it into here, and sometimes it's easier to see um, you know, that it's working correctly. All right, I'm gonna switch over to my office Zoom until four o'clock. Um, Go ahead and keep working on lab two. Hop into Zoom if you have questions about that. Um, otherwise, uh, have fun, have a great afternoon, and I will see you next week. All right, thanks. Have a nice day. Thank you, you too.